All right, so Leviticus 9. Um, y'all come at a good time with Leviticus. I know you're excited. Uh, uh, Leviticus 9 is where we are this morning. Uh, but um, I-, I want to remind you kind of where we were uh, last week. What did we talk about last week? What was Leviticus 8, for those of you that were here? It's basically the first ordination service where Aaron and his sons became the high priests, right? That, that's, kind of, that's the setting of where we are. Um, and there was a phrase that we kind of finished with last week that was repeated over and over and over and over in Leviticus 8. What was that phrase? you remember? And I asked you, just as the Lord commanded Moses, can that be said about us? And that's something that I've kind of reflected on a lot. Could the Lord say, everything I do, all day, all week, that I'm doing it just as the Lord commanded Mark, right? That, and so that's, it's, it's pretty cool that it was emphasized over and over and over, and you saw it a bunch of times in Leviticus 8. Now, I can be busy doing things, but am I busy doing the things he tells me to do, or am I just busy doing stuff that's not really from him? Now, as we get into Leviticus 9, that's the setting. You've gone through, remember, those seven days. We are on the eighth day. If you look at Leviticus 9.1, we are on the eighth day of this ordination service in Leviticus 8, in Leviticus, Leviticus 9. Now, I want you to remember something. What did they do for seven days? Do you remember what they did, what steps they did every single day for seven days that we talked about last week? Remember they made an offering and they did something pretty gross. They put blood, right ear, right thumb, right big toe, and they did that every day for seven days. What else did they do every day for seven days? They did a different type of offering, remember? Wave offering. If y'all remember... What does a wave offering say? God, I completely depend on you. I did a wave offering every single day saying, God, I completely depend on you. And the third thing is they did one other thing. that They were anointed with, what are you anointed with in the Bible? Oil. Oil. And they did that every day for seven days saying, you can only do this, become the representative to us as the high priest, if God's spirit is on you. So it was a symbolic thing. Now, I say all that to say that is the setting. And if that doesn't make sense, I know that was a quick rundown of just a little bit of what we talked about last week. If anybody needs the audio or wants to know more about that, let me know. I can get it to you. Now, turn to Leviticus 9. Somebody read verses 1 and 2 for me. It came about on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a calf, a bull, or a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before the Lord. All right, so it's the eighth day. Anybody know what the significance of eight is in the Bible? Did I spoil that yesterday by my text or something? You know. Okay. It is. Now, the Jews say it is the day of new beginnings. Why? Think about everything in the Bible that, that happens on the eighth day. What day do you dedicate a newborn child? Eighth day, Exodus 22. What day do you circumcise a boy? Eighth day. You're not going to get any questions wrong, I promise. Leviticus 12. <laughs> What day, if you have leprosy or a skin disease, do you go and, and get purification? Eighth day. That is um, Leviticus 14. What day, if you have bodily discharge, do you go and get purification for that? Eighth day, Leviticus 15. You can sacrifice an animal after they are eight days old. That is Leviticus 22. If you're a Nazarite, and you mess up, and you have to go to the purification. You do that on the eighth day. Okay, that's number six. Now, I say all that, good job, Jay. I say all that to say you see this underlying theme that says new beginnings, fresh starts, 
happen on day eight, okay? So there's no coincidence here that God says, on the eighth day, this is what happened. Now, what happened? Now, if you read your story, you're going you're gonna to see some neat things at the end, but let's talk about what they were to do for those cool things to happen. On the eighth day, Aaron and his sons were to offer a two different types of offerings. What kind were they? Sin and burnt. Now, understand these first two offerings, sin and burnt offerings, were for Aaron and his sons, not for the entire body, okay? Not for all Israel. This is work for the sin of the high priest, okay? They need to have their sins wiped clean if they're going to be the priests that God called them to be, right? Now, I say that to say, what were the two animals for the sin offering? And what did yours say, Daryl? Cat and a bull. And a ram was for the burnt offering. So a cat and a bull for the sin offering and a ram for the burnt Now tell me, the very first animal mentioned is a calf. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Aaron, the one who had the people develop a golden <laughs> calf for Israel, said the first animal I want you to offer as high priest is a so that I just wonder being if you were there if you're Aaron did something go through your mind right then when you're offering a calf as the high priest the very first time you are high priest and you're offering the very first animal is a calf that's just crazy anyway that's the first animal now in addition it was a burnt offering which was a ram now uh, those were for Aaron and sons now it says what they're on, what, what was the next type of offerings? They were on behalf of the people. Look at verses 3 and 4. Those are the, those are the which, which types of offerings did the other ones, what, what type of offerings did they do for the people? You see them? Sin. Burnt. Peace. Peace. And what would you say, Lauren? Grain. Grain. So, if you have your little cheat sheet like Daryl does, which one is not mentioned? Guilt. They give every offering that Leviticus prescribes in the first five chapters except for the guilt offering. Why would they not give the guilt offering? Do you remember what the guilt offering was? Or injured party. Yeah, but it was a personal offering. If I do something against Daryl, you would do a guilt offering. So this, this is it's a very personal type of offering. That's why that one wasn't listed. But God says... You are giving every offering that I've told you to offer, except for the guilt offerings, you are to give every offering at this ordination service as we close this off, as we close this service. Now, I want you to see, and that's for the people of Israel. Those four, they did every one of them except guilt offering for the people of Israel. Okay? Does that make sense? Am I lost anybody already? Because we're still at the beginning of our lesson. Uh, what was the reason they were doing these offerings? Look at verse 4. Why did they do these offerings? Yes. My Bible says, Today, for today, the Lord will appear, appear to you. In the Hebrew, this entire chapter, there are two words emphasized in the original Hebrew. It's today and Lord in that verse. The entire chapter. Most chapters, you have all kinds of emphasis all over the place. It's as if God says, this entire chapter is to say, this is the day that I'm going to show up to my people. Today, the Lord will appear to you. Today, the Lord will appear. Now, you also see it repeated in verse 6, don't you? Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. So you see this emphasis that this is going to be the day. You're not going to mindlessly go through tradition today. Don't just give these offerings mindlessly because there's, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Know that if you obey today, today God will appear. I just, I can't imagine the excitement as they are offering these offerings and the people are watching knowing that this is the day God shows up in our midst. And that was his promise. If you do what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to show up. Now, 
Some of you may have already read the rest of the chapter, but verses 7 through 21, it, it basically tells you that Aaron and his sons did exactly what Moses told them to do. They obeyed precisely exactly what they were supposed to do. Do you think they wanted God to show up that day? I think so. I think they were going to say, I'm doing exactly what you tell me because I want, to, I want God to show up today. Now jump down because I want to spend the most of our time today at the very end of the chapter. Look at verse 22. We're going to, we're going to start at verse 22. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering and burnt offering and the peace offerings. Guys, part of the, our role as we read God's word is to get there. Not just in our minds where we read a verse and go to the next verse. Get there. See Moses, see Aaron coming out and Aaron lifting his hands. He lifts his hands and it says that he blessed the people after making the offerings. Now what on earth does that mean? What does blessed mean? Blessed literally means, this isn't hard, to pass on benefit. Okay, that's, that's the Hebrew word, to pass on benefit. Okay, so that's not hard. I want you to look at Deuteronomy 10.8 with me. Deuteronomy 10.8. We're going we're to look at a, several other verses here today. This is talking about the priests. Okay, Leviticus 10.8. So talking about the line of Aaron. Okay, here's what it says, verse 10.8. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to stand before the Lord to serve him and to bless in his name until this day. To bless in his name. And what that literally means is if you're a priest and you offer a blessing... You're not blessing with any authority that you have because you're a priest. You're, you're blessing with God's prescription, His authority, if that makes sense. You're the conduit to offer a blessing on behalf of God. You bless in His name, in God Himself, not in who they are. Okay? You have to remember that. So God wanted the priest to bless in His name. Know that blessings have been spoken over people since the time of Moses, okay? Look at number six. This is, this is um, number six, verses 23 through 27. This is the priestly breath. This, this is huge because I, I think something's going to really hit home in just a minute if you get this, okay? Number six, going to start in verse 23, or let's do 22, start in verse 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, and here's what he used to say, The Lord bless you and keep you. You've probably heard these words before. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. That is the priestly Blessings. Did you know to this very day, you go to an Orthodox Jewish service. So you go to Israel and you go to an Orthodox Jewish service. Certain times of year, you have still people in the line of Aaron. Their name, they're, they're, they're called Kohenim. Okay, I am is plural. So if there's a person, you call them a Kohen. K-O-H-E-N. Okay. The people from the line of Aaron, all the way from when this was given, still to this day, Recite this over God's people, over what they say are his people, okay? The Jews. Now, I say that to say this has been something going on for years and years and years where the priestly class gets together and says these words. I want you to look at Luke chapter 24. I want you to see what Jesus was doing, what Jesus was doing as he was taken to heaven. Luke 24. We're going to look at the very, very end of Luke, verse 50 and to the end, okay? Here's what it says. This is the ascension. And he led them out as far as Bethany. He led his disciples out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. What does a priest, how does he bless? In the Lord's name. 
Yes, and he blesses, typically Numbers 6, is the blessing offered from the time of Moses. When somebody is offering a blessing on behalf of God, they recite number 6. What happens as he's blessing them? While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, and they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple of praise. Get into the story here. Likely, and this is not just, this is like what scholars believe, God was, Jesus was reciting number six and in the middle of him saying, the Lord bless and keep you, put his cap, all those, all of a sudden God brings him up to heaven. Now, who's doing the blessing in Leviticus 9 if Aaron comes out, lifts his head toward the people, and blesses him? Who is the one doing the actual blessing? Was it Aaron or was it God? Aaron is the conduit. God is the blessor. He's using Aaron to bless the people. Okay? Aaron was God's representative. So, so now, if you're in this culture, here's something else you've got to be thinking of. We think of blessings typically, a lot of times it's material things, right? That, I mean, just, just be honest. I mean, when we think God's blessed somebody, a lot of times we're thinking, well, they've given them this, we're giving them that. That's not their culture. That means literally nothing to God's people here. What is blessing in their culture? It's approval. It's approval. Okay, it's really good. There is one specific thing, if you add up all of the verses in the Old Testament where it talks about blessing, there is one thing attached to it more than anything else, and there's not a close second. It's descendants. To them, the greatest blessing in their culture was kids. I mean, you think about all the people that were barren and, and, and all the people that cried out to God. Why? Because the lineage... It, your, your spot in God's Bedav, his house, depended on your lineage. You had to have kids to stay in God's Bedav. Now, not getting into all that this morning, but I'm just saying, if you look up in the Bible, the most frequent thing that blessing is attached to is fertility and descendants. Just, just kind of throwing that out there. Uh, when God says, I'm going to bless you, we always think about something. I think their mindset is quite different than ours a lot of times. So look at verse 23. We're going to keep going. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. So you see Aaron and Moses going in the tent of meeting together. This is, the, by the way, the very first time besides Moses anybody else has ever been in that tent. First time. This is it right here. Very first time. And it's the very first time that he has even been in it since Exodus 40. You remember what happened in Exodus 40? Tabernacle's complete. It says the glory of the Lord came down so much so that Moses could no longer go into the tabernacle. Remember that? We talked about this several months ago. That's at the end of Exodus 40. This is the first time they were able to go back into the tent of meeting since that day, at least according to Scripture that we know of. So now, here, here's the other thing. If you're sitting there in the crowd, get there, get there on the scene, and you're watching as Moses and Aaron for the first time go into that tent of meeting since God showed up. And it's not just Moses. All of a sudden, we've got a new representative. I mean, just this is a major deal. This is a major deal. Somebody else is being high priest here. Major deal. Now, they come back out. What did they do when they came back out? When they came out, bless the people. Pronounce another blessing, maybe. If you're there, you hear them say the same, doing the same blessing again, possibly. Who knows? But then it says, the glory of the Lord appeared. Glory. Kabod. Kabod. What is that? Glory. It's heaviness or weight. It's literally what that means. Okay? Heaviness or weight. Now, here's, here's what's neat. 
Exodus 24. Moses is on Mount Sinai. What, was, what showed up there? The God of the Lord. Exodus 40. They finished the tabernacle. What shows up? The God of the Lord. It's as if, we've said this before, God was saying, I want you to remember what happened out on Mount Sinai every time you get around my tabernacle. You see what I'm saying? That's, way, that's the way Jews teach this, is what happened at Mount Sinai, and we talked through this, that was a wedding. That was a wedding ceremony between God and his people. And at the wedding... There was adultery committed at the base of the wedding with the golden calf at the wedding. So here you have this incredible marriage. And God says, every time you get around my tabernacle, I'm bringing you back into the honeymoon suite. It's a portable Mount Sinai because the glory of the Lord shows up. And then we see in Leviticus 9, as they finish the priestly ordination, the kabod, the glory of the Lord, shows up a third time. As if God is saying, I am pleased with what you've just done. With this whole priestly process, with Aaron becoming high priest, with how you satisfied me with all these offerings, and I put my stamp of approval from this day on, on this man as the high priest. Now, that, that's, that's the setting. That, that's kind of what's going on here. Now let's talk about God showed up. It was the fulfillment of verses 4 and 6, right? Today the Lord will appear to you. He did. It's pretty cool. What did the people do? They did two things. Look at verse 24. Fire came out from the, before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they... Shouted and fell on their faces. Okay, first off, let's tackle this thing about fire. Over and over in Scripture, we talked about this not long ago, fire represents who? Every time. God, we talked about that in the covenant lesson. Remember the covenant lesson with Abraham, and he goes to sleep, and there were two symbols that go through to make the covenant. The first one was fire. The second was a smoking uh, fire pot. But anyway, fire always, always represents God. Just if some of you are note-takers and want these notes, I'll be happy to give you some verses. Um, Exodus 3, verse 2. Exodus 19, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Psalms 18, verses 8 through 14. Isaiah 33, verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. Malachi chapter 3, verse 2. That's just some, but I just want to give you a taste of over and over. When God is at work, there are many, many times you see fire involved. Now, it didn't stop in just the Old Testament. Think about New Testament. John the Baptist promised Jesus would come to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3. Day of Pentecost. Acts 2. We see the Holy Spirit make himself known with tongues of fire. Jesus even says that he came to send fire on the earth and that he wished it were already kindled. That's Luke 12. Now I say all that to say fire often accompanies the presence of God. Don't miss the imagery. Okay? There's so many, so many places we can go to talk about why. We don't have time this morning. But uh, just know that fire represents God so often. He is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12. Now, knowing that God shows up among them how do the people respond? The first thing they says is they shout it. They shout it. I know you love these Hebrew words. You know Raynon. Okay, Raynon. That's a weird looking in in the middle of it, so what? Raynon. Okay? Raynon. Now, what does Raynon mean? It means a joyful shout of elation. Like, you know what Paul Bell yells out in the middle of services all the time that scares half the congregation? That's Raynon, right? That's, that's Raynon, okay? So, almost every other time this word is used in Scripture, it is always translated joy, just so you know. 
It's, 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 why? Because joy is so closely attached to this word, you can't separate the two. Meaning this, when God showed up, the very first reaction was absolute joy. God is here. He is in our midst. Now, did you know this is the very first time in all of the Bible that this word is mentioned? If you want to know the definition of joy today, this many years later, the definition of joy comes from when we are in the presence of the God of the universe. That is joy. You can't have it apart from that. It comes when we're in his presence. So, in this case, joy is expressed when people come in contact with him. For us, it's when we're in the presence of Jesus Christ, right? When we're in his presence. And there's a reason why one of the, the fruit of the Spirit, one, one of them is joy. It's because when you are abiding in Christ, when you're allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you, you know what comes out? This expression of Renan is joy that you cannot contain. You can't hide. It is something that just naturally overflows from you, right? That is joy. You have to ask, do others see that flowing out of you? And people around you, at your work, if families around you, do they feel this overwhelming outflow of joy because you can't contain it? And if you can't say yes, I have to ask, are you truly abiding in Christ? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to be evident through you to those around you? Because if you are, those around you will know your joy. It doesn't matter the circumstance you go through, whether you get a, a mass in your colon that you don't know what it is and you have a week to wait to hear the results. Joy overflows because of who Jesus Christ is. And no matter what we're going through, he's there too. Joy. Now, there's something else, though, that people did besides joy. What was it? They fell on their faces. Now, we see this time and time again. When God shows up, you see the people of God respond in one way. And it's absolute hitting our face. Hitting our face. That's to fall on our face as we understand who we are. We don't deserve to be in his presence, but who he is. That I am in the presence of God, the God of the universe. And it's, it's a posture of respect and awe. And, and we fall on our face when you're overwhelmed. I mean, I've seen, you know, people... Um, you go different places and you see all these people and, and you see all these responses of, of, of people when they meet like their idol or whatever. You know, the person they look up to and you see this, just, I mean, what do they do like if you go into England and you see the queen or the king? I mean, there's, there's this reverence and awe with bowing down, right? There's this reverence and awe. But here's the thing. Have you ever thought about what you're going to do the first time you see Jesus? You ever... You know, you sing songs like I Can Only Imagine, right? What's the lyric there? Fall on my face, dance. Uh, yeah. Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? And you can keep going. We're not going to break out in song here. Oh, come on. You know from here. Not even speak at all. Daryl can only imagine. All right. Now, what happens... Trying to stay on track in Revelation 4. Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. What happens in Revelation when the elders see Jesus? They do. Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. And you see this picture of what we're going to do when we truly meet Jesus. The, the guys, you're not going to just stand in his presence. Yes, to your knees will you fall. As a matter of fact, on your face will you fall. 
And, and then, not just that, they threw their crowns as if to say, God, even the accolades that may have been given to me belong to you. I understand who you are. I understand who I am. And then they break out in praise. God, you are worthy. God, you, you are worthy to receive honor and glory and power. You created all things, and that's, what that, that's why they exist. And they understand whose presence they're in. Now, I hope you look forward to that moment as much as I do. But here's the thing. Just going back into the culture of, of, of Judaism, since we're talking about Leviticus this morning, one thing that hit me in Israel when I was there, I'm at the Wailing Wall, and I know I've shared some of this stuff before, but, but you see, you know, you watch these Jews pray. How do they pray? They go back and forth and back and forth. They do it for two reasons. I can share the second reason with you later. I don't have time this morning. The first reason, the main reason, though, is this. Every time they used to get to the name of God, you know what they did? They hit the face. Every time when they were reading his word, if they were listening to the Torah, the scroll being read, they would give them faith every time God's name. How many times is God's name mentioned in the Bible? So what they started doing was they're just kind of a constant almost bowing motion, right? It's a constant bowing motion, shuckling. S-U-C-K-L-E-N is one word. Some people call it davening. That really just means prayer. But it's this, this constant kind of bowing to God as they pray. And you see this unusual posture. They've been doing this for centuries. Just imagine Jesus and the disciples and they're praying just using that posture. Now, now, these, just, just getting to those two expressions, the idea of the shouting for joy, the elation of being in the presence of God when God's glory showed up among them in Leviticus 9, temp, just in conjunction with this whole idea that they understood this overwhelming sensation of I know who I am, I know who God is. That, those things go together. Listen to Psalms 2.11. Here's what it says. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. You see how when you come in the presence of God, yeah, you're to worship. You are to rejoice. You are to be excited that God himself is among you. At the same time, do it with reverence, with trembling, knowing who he is. Now, I say that for one reason. We are to joyfully respond to him when he shows his will. There's no doubt about that. We are to do exactly what he tells us to do. But here's the thing. You will never be obedient to worship him and respond to him like he wants you to if you also don't understand who he is. That he is your Lord. He is your God. He, you are his slave. That when he says something, he wants you to do it. If you don't understand and truly fear Reverently fear him, you will never be on this side of worshiping him as he calls you to do. It goes hand in hand. Now, when I started thinking about this, my mind went back to Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5, you see Ananias and Sapphira. What did they do? They sold land, but they, and they said, here, we're giving it all to the disciples, but did they really? Why did they do that? Anybody know? Do what? Yeah, exactly. What happened just before it? Acts 4. Barnabas, just before it, the very end of Acts 4. You know what he does? He sells land. You know what he does? He gives his money to the apostles. But Barnabas is a man of integrity. Barnabas does it for the right reasons, and Barnabas didn't hold back anything. And all of a sudden, Ananias and Sapphira would rather look holy then be holy. And they say, well, we'll do it too. God didn't tell them. They just said, well, look, Barnabas is doing it. We can do this. Let's sell some land. Oh, let's keep a little bit. Here it is. Here's my money. They wanted to look holy, but not be holy. Guys, it matters who we are. Are we more interested in looking holy or being holy? What did God do to them? Struck them it says they breathed their last. Now, what was the response of God's people? There was great fear. Now, I say this because I want you to see. 
Ananias and Sapphira wanted to look the part but not be the real deal. God is not pleased if we come here and look the poor part and we're not the real deal. Matter of fact, it makes him angry that we are dragging his name through the mud. We're acting like, God, we are all in for him, yet we're not living it out. That is a terrible testimony to the world. So here's the thing. Fear, I'm just telling you, we need to fear playing church. We need to fear, we need to fear trying to deceive God. That's exactly what it says Ananias and Sapphira tried to do, was deceive God and the Holy Spirit. We need to fear acting like this right here is a game to be played. It's not. And I'm telling you, you need to fear trivializing what Christ did on the cross. Do not live like it doesn't matter. Do not live like it doesn't matter. This is not a game to be played. You did not get bonus points for coming early today and listening to this lesson. Live for Christ. Fear is an element that's necessary if we're going to be completely obedient. I'm just, I'm just saying. Now, all this happened on the eighth day. I know we need to finish. All this happened on the eighth day of priestly ordination. The day of new beginnings. There was a new representative to God that day. A representative of the people. His name was Aaron. There was a new representative to God that day to the people. His name was Aaron. That's the high priest. Maybe today, as we go through this, you realize you need a new beginning. Guess what? We serve a God that loves to give new beginnings. He always has. That's why you see so many eighth days in Scripture. He loves to give new beginnings. He did not make this into a game to be played. Maybe this needs to be a day. You draw a line in the sand and say, God, no longer. Not going through motions. I'm going to live on fire for you. God, we just thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, God, for what you're teaching us, even in Leviticus, which many of us haven't really studied in detail. God, I just thank you that your word is so rich. God, you can teach us from every page. God, I pray that what we've learned today, God, mold it on our hearts, God. May we be men and women that run hard after you, not playing the game of Christianity or church, but God, being a disciple, dying to ourselves every day, and living for you. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.